Good evening from Daunt Books Marathon. Uh, we're delighted to welcome you again into the shop in this virtual way. Uh, and it's a huge pleasure uh, to, to welcome Rachel Holmes and Shami Chakrabarti here to talk about Rachel's uh, new book, Sylvia Pankhurst, Natural Born Rem Rebel. Um, it is, I think, quite clearly a definitive portrait of an extraordinary woman. Um, extraordinary women deserve extraordinary biographers. Uh, and we've got this exactly here with um, Rachel Holmes's book. Um, and we're delighted that Sharon Chakrabarti is here again, once again in the shop uh, to put the questions to Rachel. She's of course a Labour peer in the House of Lords. Uh, she was director of Liberty. She wrote two wonderful books um, on, on Liberty and of women. And we're really grateful that both have come here tonight to Marathon. We can have about half an hour of chat. Um, do put some questions through online. There are signed copies of the book uh, available on our website. But for the moment, uh, Rachel and Shami, welcome both. Shami, over to you. Thanks so much. It is a huge pleasure to be back in my favourite my favorite bookshop, um, which is Dawn's Marathon for the, for the first time since the lockdown. Goodness me, isn't this a time when we need our books? So welcome book lovers and congratulations, Rachel. Rachel Holmes, you've, written, you. you've written so much, but in particular, this is now your, your fourth um, major biography. Of course, the, the other three um, were James Barry, Sarah and Sarah Bartman, um, and I think both of those um, books are in new editions. It also out this week so today. Be, today as well, congratulations for, for that too, and so, so that will be of interest to, um, to to readers. And of course, your last book um, was the fated um, Eleanor Mark. So congratulations on this brick of a feminist book, and uh, and don't um, feminist subjects deserve these great big books? Um, it's probably quite useful for, for fighting fascists. Oh, it's a missile. It's, it's a, a missile for yeah, fighting decapitates fascists. Decapitates fascists um, at three paces. Um, so, so Sylvia Pankhurst would have, would have approved of that. Um, so Sylvia Pankhurst, daughter of, I, say, I suppose that the first family of feminism, the Pankhurst, daughter of that family, a socialist suffragette, but, but a lifetime socialist, didn't, didn't move from, from that. Feminist internationalist, anti-racist, um, African liberationist, um, but also an artist, we'll talk about that perhaps in, in, in a bit, as well as an activist writer and, and publisher. A huge life and, and, and his book to, to go with that. I suppose my first question is, why Sylvia Pankhurst and, and why now? Well, I'm going to answer that, but I do just also want to say thank you very much to to Dawn. So it's it's fantastic to be back here, and thank you very much for doing this, and, 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 and thank you for being here too. There is something very comforting and wonderful to be here, surrounded by these books. Why Sylvia Pankhurst? Why now? Well, <clears throat> she, as well as fighting for women's rights, famously is an anti-fascist and anti-racist, um, and uh, you know, fought very fought campaigns in the uh, for post colonial campaigns, and so when we put her in that broader context, she is, I feel, for all the wrong, for not very good reasons, I'm afraid that she is actually very relevant to uh, the politics of our moment. Um, not only uh, going into in a, a pandemic in Britain, you know, in a time of austerity and the consequences of that. But then uh, also in terms of things that are very visible and very, very relevant to her legacy, whether it's Black Lives Matter, whether it's Extinction Rebellion. Well, I, well, I noticed that um, the great Lem Sisse, the great British poet Lem Sisse, who, who has um, written a, a lovely endorsement of the book, um, says that Sylvia Pankhurst was protesting that Black Lives Matter before the term was invented. I thought that was very... Um, that was very pithy and, and a great tribute, not just to your book, but, but to Sylvia from Lem Sisse. Do you want to develop that? Well, you, um, <clears throat> you mentioned uh, Manchester, and of course, yeah, and, and actually that's a connection just because with, with, with Lem Sisse that there's Manchester, and he's British, but he's also British Ethiopian, and of course Sylvia uh, ends up uh, an honorary Ethiopian and is buried in a patriot's grave in Ethiopia, and that's a very important part of her story. But uh, the... The, the connection there, I think, is very clear, and it goes back to them being the first family of, 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 of feminism, but a radical Manchester family. And before they, uh, 
before Emmeline started the uh, Women's Social and Political Union, indeed with the, with the other women in the ILP who did, uh, Richard Pankhurst, Sylvia's father, who was a barrister and a three times failed um, um, uh, parliamentary candidate, um, was uh, an, an abolitionist. I mean, they were as much part of the abolitionist movement, they came out of that tradition. Mm. And of course, Black Lives Matter is not something, it, 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 it's not a moment, it's a movement, and it's a movement of 500, 600 years, and it begins with uh, opposition to slavery. to slavery and runs all the way through. And what and what we're dealing with at the moment, uh, the resistance we're seeing is an iteration of the movement. movement. I think that's very important. So Black Lives Matter isn't just about one particular um, incident of police abuse that gets people righteously furious. There's a long tradition and a movement, and you're writing is about people's history and people's movements. Isn't it? But can you tell us why you chose Sylvia after Eleanor Marr? Well, uh, the, <clears throat> there's a direct connection and they, the, they subjects, I feel that they walk, they, they sort of, they come in different ways, they approach you in different ways, they walk towards you in different ways or they, they grab you uh, literally in a different way. And with Sylvia, actually, she's in. She makes a very passing appearance um, in in Eleanor Marks, my last book. Um, when she meets, I tell the story of how she meets uh, as a thirteen year old teenager with her father. She's taken to see William. So, there's a, so I felt that it's literally a sequel, and that when you think that that, that Eleanor Marx dies tragically um, at the at the at the very end of the nineteenth century, and that that Sylvia steps into that, that she takes on she literally she's a great woman of the twentieth century. She's a great woman of the twentieth century, but she takes on that baton, the baton of, of, of freedom. She's a socialist. She's yeah, a feminist. I mean, this is quite this is quite significant too, isn't it, for your writing because you your past work sets you very much as a Victorianist. The, the previous subjects in 19th century subjects. I had to lie down for a week when Victoria died. I mean, it's, the, <laughs> it, it's the first time I was I was there sort of beavering away and Victoria dies and I'm so, and suddenly I'm thinking something strange and something feels and I've been you know for all the years I've been doing this Victoria's never been she dead. There. And uh, yeah, right. I had to lie down and have a cup of tea. Where Sylvia Pankhurst lives until 1960 and Elvis Presley is, is topping mm. the hit parade but at the time of her death. So that's a, that's a, that's a really serious departure from, from you. But you've been celebrated by 20th century historians like Gerard de Groot who gave you the most amazing um, review in the Times I, I noticed. Again, um, congratulations. But, but we're, talk, we're talking about um, direct action, talking about suffragettes, talking about direct action. You said, I think in your preface, um, that there was something that there wouldn't be a Greta Thunberg if there hadn't been a Sylvia Pankhurst. Very specific connection. And I, I think you're referencing direct action about mm -hmm. which there's been quite a lot of debate recently. And teenage activism. In the context the of Extinction Rebellion. Yeah. We talked about Black Lives Matter. What mm -hmm. about Extinction Rebellion? You know, what, you know, um, I noticed again you did start the week on 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 Radio Four earlier in the week. There was some discussion about moderation and extremism and who is a moderate and who is an extremist. I, I think there's a little passage of your of your book that you might that you might read. Uh, yeah, I mean, the, um, and you use this story on the radio to to make your point about about this. Um, this so-called distinction between extremism, which is a bad thing, and moderation. And also the idea that direct action um, and the, the necessity uh, to keep campaigning on the streets, to keep using certain forms of, of militancy. And, and Sylvia had described herself as that she was a very reluctant militant, yeah. but never the best militant she was. Um, and uh, as you say, I'm going to draw that analogy, uh, just because she, they were teenagers. And they were also teenagers who were 
who were saying to their mothers, and this movement had been going on for 100 years, but they were saying to their mothers, um, it's, it's time to shake things up, things are moribund. But in, in terms of that question of how you achieve change, mm -hmm. you have, it's a combination right. of factors. And I'm, um, I'm appalled, um, irritated, but appalled at the moment by um, the, the, this, la this language that somehow that, that there was no legitimacy to, to street protest, protest, to street protest. Right. And I think that um, the, the, the one that uh, always comes to mind for me in, with Sylvia is the uh, there was uh, her the East End deputation. So the um, the moment in history when um, she and the East London Federation of Suffragettes ask uh, Asquith, the notorious um, misogynist, opposed to women's vote, but he was a liberal, a liberal, <laughs> yes, um, <laughs> who and who will not entertain or not entertain the idea of it. And she's petitioning him, and she's petitioning him, and eventually she writes to him. And um, she explains how, how you know, the, the large proportion of women in the East End of London are living under terrible conditions. These women are impatient to take a constitutional part in moulding the conditions under which they have to live. I cannot think, this is Sylvia to ask with, that if you realise the strength and earnestness of the movement here, it would fail to make an impression on you. And she issued him an ultimatum so far unprecedented in her political career. And I always think of this as her Rivonia moment with Nelson Mandela at the Rivonia trial. He's standing up and he says, in, in this cause, in this cause for non-racial democracy and freedom and liberation, this is a cause for which I am prepared to die. And this is the same to Mandela, of course, you know, that, but in that context, it's a similar context. So, she says, I regard this dep deputation of such importance that I have determined that should you refuse to receive the deputation and I be snatched away from the people and taken back to Holloway, my cat and mouse license having expired, I will not merely hunger strike in Holloway as I have done eight times under this present sentence. But when I am released, I shall continue my hunger strike at the door of the stranger's entrance to the House of Commons and shall not take either food or water until you agree to meet this deputation. I know very well from what has happened in the past that I am risking my life in coming to this conclusion because so far you have almost invariably refused the appeals which suffragists have made to you. At the same time, I feel it my duty to take this course and I shall not give way although it may end in my death. And Asquith refused again, and then that, that is exactly what she did. And she came out of prison, and she demanded that she was taken and laying down, and she lay there, and she said, either you're going to see this deputation, uh, or I am going and to he die. Did. And he, he did. did. And when he saw them, they made their depositions, <coughs> and they explained who they were, and at the end, Asquith said... Um, having never met working women before and having heard about their conditions, how they lived and what their wages were. And he said, you make your, you make very reasonable and moderate demands. He actually used that word. So in other words, word. this, so what's brilliant about the story is it shows the relationship mm. between direct action and so-called extreme protest and actually getting people into the door to be heard through parliamentary channels. And that's very Sylvia. Yeah. So what so that was she was an enabler. She was always she, an enabler. She was always about give, you know, using the tools that she had to create the opportunity for other people to be able to speak for and represent themselves. So that story Can I ask you about so Sylvia Pankhurst was a prolific writer. Mm. <laughs> so a publisher. Um, but she was a prolific writer. And I just wondered as a writer, what is that like? Writing uh, the life of someone who has produced so much, so much themselves. She's a newspaper editor. Uh, she wrote books. She wrote memoirs. She wrote history books. Uh, she wrote economic papers. She also wrote fiction, plays, poetry, um, novels, unfinished novel, uh, and indeed dreams. I mean, she like does, does, that, does, that, does that make it more fun or more interesting or, or more daunting? No, it's it's absolutely wonderful to work with someone. Uh, who, uh, who, who, who is, who has that voice, and who is is constantly telling you what they think. The the down, not the downside of it, but the challenge of it is that Sylvia was 
incredibly prolific and she also she also worked so hard and was indefatigable that the size of the archive which is constantly expanding and constantly growing um because you know she only she only died in 1960 in historical terms it's quite recent and again because she's a woman that it's still being added to and put together and i know that you've made the call in in your preface i think or or perhaps in the afterwards for her for her complete works to finally be be published so that's a campaign that's a campaign that's my to, campaign to, to come out to, to come out of this and i know also I, that, that there is a a wonderful campaign for a statue yes. um, um, of Sylvia. That again, in this period of lockdown, there have been many great culture wars, and one has been about statues. And indeed, um, you know, Sylvia's um, sometime nemesis, Winston Churchill, has been the subject of controversy. His, his statue in Parliament Square was daughter of the words was a, um, was a racist. But there is this campaign, and, and if any readers watching tonight want to want to get get behind a campaign for Sylvia Pankhurst statue from Clark and Well Green. There is a there is a just giving page um, for Sylvia's statue, and you can you, you can look that up. And that is one approach to the statue wall. Well, indeed, I mean there there are many statues that, that need to be perhaps sort of mothballed for a bit, or yeah, just them. curation, curation, um, and and there are many that we don't need to. But but this is obviously this is definitely one I do want, and and I believe the campaign is very very but, nearly there. But very back, close to me, so it's hard. If, if I might go back for a moment to, to Sylvia's writing, you've been incredibly generous in your um, book to you know the other Sylvians, the the academics and and, and the other men and women who've, who've who've looked at her archive over the years. But you did discover yourself something really quite exciting, didn't you? I think in in, in the British Library. Ah yes, well I, yeah, I um, there there are um, there are some new discoveries, uh, quite a few new discoveries in the book. But one in particular is a uncannily relevant um, to to the pandemic and that's um, I discovered a previously um, unsorted and untranscribed cache of uh, Her Majesty, His Majesty, as it was at the time, His Majesty's um, Holloway Prison Standard Issue toilet paper on which Sylvia had uh, transcribed. Uh, so this is clandestine writing clandestine. whilst in, you know, if you think you're a writer out there and you, you're prepared to sacrifice for your, you know, for your, for your art. So this woman is secretly writing on prison toilet paper whilst incarcerated. And this was in like, this is not as a suffragette, this is later. 1921, she was, this is when she's in prison, in for, prison sedition. for sedition. So she's defending freedom in the press for some of her own journalists for her own newspaper. And in that six month term, she's owned, because she's a political prisoner, she's only permitted a slate um, and chalk. And so she drafts, um, poetry, but as as I also discovered, a play um, and you and transcribed, you, you transcribed this for the purposes of the, of the book. Yeah, and she transcribed and she kept them on 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 blue paper, on toilet paper, which yeah. she then you know sort of sequestered away uh, in the underclothes oh, and her yeah. lovely prison uniform. So perhaps panic buying of toilet paper wasn't so ridiculous <laughs> um, after all in, in in trying in trying times. So again, Professor De Brute said in his um, in, in his amazing. Review. I mean, I don't think I've ever read anything like it. Of your miraculous book, that the, the child is mother to, to to the woman, and a lot of people will be fascinated by the Pankhurst family um, and their relationships. Um, but you chose, in particular, um, as a jumping point, um, a jumping off point for the narrative of her life, the death of her father, Richard Pankhurst, when Sylvia was sixteen. Why was that so important? Do you think? Because I think that it's it, it's a moment that that it's a fundamental fault, like a break point. It it shapes her so profoundly that what happens, and as you say, this is it, it's a story about it's a story of sisters. I mean, it's a stark saga and a political story and of, of, of sisters and and indeed and their the mother between them. Yeah, but with but when her father died at sixteen. A, Emmeline, her mother, and her elder sister Christabel were away in Geneva. And Richard Pankhurst, her father, who she adored, died disastrously on her watch. On her watch, okay. And during the days where she was trying to trying to understand what was going on, every time she went to figures of authority, whether it was the cook, uh, whether it was the doctor, uh, whether it was her own father, who she was trying to persuade to call, she 
she felt afterwards that if only she had not listened to them, if she had so she was essentially them, fobbed off. She was she, was she really felt really fobbed off, and then she listened to these authority figures, and the worst thing that could possibly happen happened. She lost her father. So, so bad you, things happen if when you, you give in to authority, and that is yeah. that's the driver. I think that that's I think that's a very uh, that's a very shaping moment, and that's why the book opens at the age of sixteen, and also with the death of the father, and you and. And then beyond that, you use this wonderful phrase that you know should have that could have been um, from Freud or Marx, but it's actually a Rachel Holmes phrase, I think. <laughs> um, you say all civil wars begin in the family, which I found a very, very poignant, um, um, very poignant phrase, um, you know, which I thought about a lot. And of course, this schism in the first family of feminism, Emmeline and Christopher go one way um, and, and, and split with Sylvia. This must be very painful personally, but it's, in, it's very significant politically too, isn't it? And some people say that, um, that we can see that rupture even in modern day mm. feminism mm. between left and right feminism mm. for want of it. Um, what, what was it really? Was it, just, was it essentially the First World War or was it to do with autocracy versus democracy in the movement? Or That's where it, it began. Was so it the involvement of men or the shunning of men? Was it socialism? Well, all of the above. Right. And um, and I and and because because it because because it is all of those and it take takes place over a number of years, um, I you know I, I tell that story in detail. But it began the, the, the first break it began with two things. It began with Sylvia's um, unwavering commitment to the fact that, that votes for women had to, and of necessity to make sense, had to include working women, working class women of, you know, of, of the East End and everywhere else, and that it was not a limited vote. Um, and, but, the, but the beginning of the rift and then falling out was when Emmeline and Christabel, but Emmeline in particular, decided that she was going to take the WSPU, the Women's Social and Political Union, away from being a democratic organisation to an autocracy. And Sylvia said, trust the voters, trust the members, they will vote for you, they love you, let's keep this. And it wasn't just Sylvia, it was also Emily and Pitt and Fred Pethick Lawrence, who were the funders. And, but that schism began there between them, and from there, as you say, it moved It moved into to other things, and then ultimately the break over the war and pacif pacifism and fighting. Okay, it might be my personality, I'm certainly not known for being the sunniest, you know, the, the sunniest person. And I don't want to rain on the parade of your wonderful publication today, but I have to use the T word and talk about torture. Ah. Right. And, and Pauline Bryan, who reviewed, who reviewed your book, I think in, in, in Tribune, you know, spoke about this. But you do deal with Sylvia's torture quite quite graphically in in the book. And I've and, and I've often thought that this period in British history is sanitised, mm. and it was sanitised. You know, we had the sort of um, Centenary, you know, the 2018 celebrations and the you know, Millicent Fawcett statue went up, etc., uh, etc. Et but we didn't really talk as a nation about the shameful part of that story, which is a British government um, essentially ordering the torture of women um, in prison by forced feeding, mm. which is a form of torture. And it wasn't just forced feeding. Um, I hope there aren't any youngsters watching this. Um, it wasn't just force feeding via the, you know, via the esophagus, which is bad enough. It, there was also, um, there was rape, hmm. um, and you had to write, you had to deal with this in your book. And I would have thought that's quite a difficult thing for a writer to approach. A emotionally, but B making decisions about how graphic to be. It was you only do torture form, do you? But, yeah, but it was uh, it was it was it was very difficult to do. But it was um, it was a very conscious decision. I felt that that part of the story uh, needs to to be written, and it's part of Sylvia's story anyway. And the way that I approached it was twofold. I I did find it difficult, it, and it made me feel like yeah, it, it's really hard writing about stuff like that. And but it had to be it had to be done. But I spoke to uh, friends who are crime fiction writers okay. because I thought that would sort of give me some help in terms of how you how you how you make sure that you stay you stay on the right side of that. But then the other thing is the way I approached it. Um, and you know, this you appreciate this as, as a lawyer is that I, I thought if I take it if I if I tell the story through her testimony, mm -hmm. so it's her she's witness, it's her witness testimony, and she was the, so she that's was, how you avoid any sense of 
of torture porn or exploitation. I hope so. You just present her testimony. I hope so. Um, well, thank thank you for doing that because I do I do think it's important to confront the past. Um, and so also just to as I mean, we we know something and 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 of of the the force feeding and of course it was torture even though the king and government said it wasn't although the Daily Mail and George Bernard Shaw said it was yes the Daily Mail I mean shout out for the Daily Mail I haven't always done this but no credit where it's due the Daily Mail were very very sound on on this being torture and being wrong at the time is that that's correct yes yeah. they went they went against the the, the um the, the other thing is people who, people who are interested in newspapers would be very interested in this book not just because of sylvia's own uh, newspapers but because of her relationship with the big you know the big giants of the british press many of which are still, you know are still around today including including the, the the Daily Mail and what was then the Manchester Guardian. Now. She definitely she worked with the press. She, she of course she wrote in the Manchester Guardian. Yeah. Now the Guardian famously, but she also wrote in the Mirror. She wrote in uh, she wrote in the Mail. And sometimes the family were having their feuds in in the national and international in, press. Absolutely in international media. But <laughs> just back on the back yeah. on the back on the torture and abuse point. Yeah. I think it's also important to remember. And again, it's something that I track very closely in her story in the book. The level of violence that was done to the suffragettes on the streets as well in print that is very relevant to how we think about current protests so things you know they they were beaten up they had their they had their hair brutally pulled they had their breasts twisted they were dragged down the sides of alleyways and raped both you know and um, when they were when they were put into into police wagons they were made to pull up their skirts and tie them over the tops of their heads so i think that there, and people women died, had long-term injuries um, and illnesses and, and suffered really badly, including Mary Clark, who and was and yet, death, of course, Sylvia, who was tortured more than any other suffragette, lives to a great old age, which is kind of, I mean, the, the she's sort of, phenomenally resilient. She's it's amazing, really she's impressive. Yeah, just it's one, really impressive. Could I ask you, just for a moment, we, we don't have that long, um, to touch on her relationship with some of the great male figures of 20th century history, because we've talked a lot about the suffragette struggle, but her life goes on well beyond that. Mm. And she has encounters um, encounters and long-term relationships of different kinds with Churchill, Churchill Lenin, Lenin, Israel Zangwill, George Bernard Shaw, he's always Obviously there. Obviously Haile Selassie. Hala, Haile Selassie for a very, very long um, period of her life. Churchill assaults her. Yes. I've, read, I've read the account in the book and it is a physical assault. So as a lawyer, he was this, I think it was a physical It was a violent assault. It was a violent was, assault. And then his goons lock her up in a in, in a room from which she has this, there's a false, there's an assault and then a false imprisonment. So she turns up at a meeting, I tell the story in the book, and she asks him about votes for women. He doesn't like it. They, he doesn't like it, and he literally yeah. manhandles her by the arm, forces her down. Then the goons put her in, in, in effectively lock her up in a room which she escapes. Which is false imprisonment, and then she escapes. Yeah, so there we go. We need to look at our great heroes and our national myths, all, all to all. Lenin's rather patronizing. Well, they, they, if it, ultimately, <clears throat> The relationship with Lenin is very uh, is very interesting, and it's really really important to British the British history of the left and the Communist Party. They start off on very good terms, yeah. and they are they're, they're on good terms for a very long time. But by the end of it, they fall over the question of um, actually parliamentary democracy. And, and Lenin wants her to. No, Lenin thinks that the, the British Communist Party. She he wants her to follow his policy. The British Communist Party must work in alliance with the Labour Party. And Sylvia says, "I really advise you strongly against doing that because it's not going to work." <laughs> not gonna, um, past but on the subject of the Labour Party, of course, people would want you to just say a little something about the relationship with Keir Hardie, the first leader of the Labour Party, the sainted, the now sainted, but not always sainted, um, Keir Hardie. Mm -hmm. Now um, we were talking about. Uh, Fighting over World War One, splits on the left and splits in the family mm. over World War One. I, I, I won't read it because there isn't much time, but but there is a very chilling passage in the book about Keir Hardy speaking against the war, and I think it's pretty fair to say that now, pretty much everybody across the political spectrum uh, and historians think the First World War was a great calamity and terrible and unnecessary and not a just war but an imperialist war. And all those innocent stuff. And there's a passage in the book where Keir Hardy is speaking against the war, and, it, and, mm. and it's yeah. it's really chilling. And I'm speaking in the House of Commons as leader of the Labour Party about how awful this would be. And then you describe this cold, cold wind behind him, and Labour MPs, people on his own side, are singing "God Save the King" to, mm. to undermine him. 
What a terrible, terrible story. That'll never happen again, will it? Um, <laughs> um, so just, just finally, we have to talk about this, this final period in Ethiopia. She's had a tough old life. <clears throat> She's suffered so many privations, but at the end, it is a it is a glorious um, end, isn't it? An old lady surrounded by friends and loved ones. Yes, I mean the, the, her relationship with with Ethiopia goes goes back, you know, right right to the nineteen twenties. I mean, it's a bit, it's it's a very very long part of her life, and it's and it's more than 30, 40 years of her, thirty years of her political life um, in relation to um, fighting. Mussolini's, you know, racist imperialist war with the Italian um, yeah. Ethiopian war, which she's profoundly against, and she, which she sees and quite correctly predicts that if he's not stopped there, then you know his pupil Hitler was going to follow him. And uh, but as, as uh, time progresses, she eventually, in the last few years of her life, uh, at the invitation of of, of, of Selassie and his family, um, who've been saying for some years, you know, why don't you, you know, why, why don't you come and live in Addis? And she moves, and this is something absolutely wonderful. She gets on a BOAC flight with her son Richard and their cat Pity. And I and the wonderful late Rita Pankhurst, um, who I um, who, you met. who I was very very um, delighted and and and, and honoured to meet, and who was absolutely wonderful. And she said very laconically, she said, "I think I think that Pretty was the first Persian cat that was taken on Brit on on Brit on on, on easy." And she had all. But yeah, she did the show. And maybe she 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 did. I mean. No death is is a is a joyous thing, perhaps, but in this period of pandemic and, and people losing loved ones and so on, we do we do reflect a little on on a happy ending or, or it is absolutely. I mean, and as a biographer, that is something you can talk about. But it really is. We know as a matter of, of daily discussion now, and we can remember that that it is meaningful to say that you can have a good death or about that there are good deaths. And she and had there a lot of ones around her. She was still working, and she, up until the last day of her life, I mean, and she had a glory, and then a glorious state funeral in her adopted country of Ethiopia, where they adore her. There's some lovely passages. I don't want to give anything away, but there's a particularly beautiful passage in the. One in of the afternoon. things that's really wonderful about the funeral, yeah, and, and yes, as you say, highly Selassie asks Richard Pankhurst and says, "Where you know, where, yeah. where would you like your mother buried?" And obviously, would have been happy to bring yeah. her back to, to Britain, but she, um, she, he, what she wanted to to be there. And if there is actually some footage you can find on YouTube, the medium of the current moment, but I'm completely um, of the funeral and. What's extraordinary about it is when you see her being given a state funeral there and being laid in a patriot's grave um, uh, with, with, with all of the, the, um, the, the finery and how it was done. And all those white robes are somehow and reminiscent robes. of the... And it looks very much like... And it's very evocative of those suffragette processions and the white robes and the parasols and all those things that Sylvia animated. That she her. designed, the, uh, the artist who became the activist and designed the campaign. Final question, sum up her legacy. I know you sort of did it in a, in, in a thousand pages, but in a few words. How well, sort of love and enthusiasm, that was that was her motto. She's love and enthusiasm, I mean, she says, I, you know, despite what the materialists say, that those are things that are really important in life. No pass around, fight the racists, fight the fascists, fight injustice, fight inequality. Um, she loved art, loved music, and the price of freedom um, is eternal vigilance. I think it will be. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, thank you very much. Some really nice comments coming in. Um, just noting particularly what, what Dynamo's mother and daughter were and just how inspiring um, she clearly was, but I think particularly as well, how inspiring this chat has been. So um, thank you both of you, Rachel Holmes, Shami Chakrabarti. And thank you for everybody here for, for joining us. Thank you and good night. Thank you very much. Thank you.